So welcome everyone. Uh, good night, good afternoon, good morning. It doesn't matter where you are. Uh, welcome to this live webinar. You know, in this opportunity, we have a special guest. Um, I know a lot of you knows perfectly who is near. Um, I know you, most of you maybe read their, their past book, Hooked, uh, and now you're enjoying, what is this new book about it? So we're about to start. I just want to wait like one more minute to start, like um, let the people join us today. And so in the meantime, I just want to let you know that, um, you know, in pro school, we have a lot of events uh, every week. We have on-site events, we have online events. And we have this kind of like webinar every Thursday and you can, you know, follow a lot of um, different speakers for this product management world. Um, so just in case you didn't know, Pro School offers um, different product management certificates online on our 20 campuses worldwide. On top of that, every week we offer, you know, this kind of events. Um, so, you know, head over to proschool.com after this webinar to check them out. Um, so as you already know, today we have again Nir, and I would like to introduce or read something about Nir. Um, you know, Nir Rice consults and teaches about the intersection of psychology, technology, and business. He holds a bachelor degree from Emory University, majoring in political science and an MBA from Stanford University. Um, since 2003, Nir founded two tech companies and taught at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. He's most well known for his best-selling book, Hooked. Um, now he is contributing writer for TechCrunch and Psychology Today, as well as maintaining his personal blog. So you can go to nearandfar.com. Uh, the MIT Technology Review, near Yale, the profit um, of habit forming technology. Um, so we have the opportunity. We are honored to have, have him here today. Um, so he's going to be having his talk of around 30 minutes. Uh, you can, you know, write any question, type any question in the comments on Facebook. Uh, he will be answering some question at the end of his presentation. So Nir, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate everything. Um, you can teach us your knowledge, your expertise. And it's a pleasure to have you here. And it's a pleasure to, you can share with our community uh, today. So it's all yours. Welcome. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. No? Okay, yep. terrific. All right. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. Give me just one moment. Okay, you can see the slide, the opening slide? Yes, perfect. Terrific. Okay, well, welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that you're here, that you've joined me. Today, we're going to talk about how to become indistractable. You know, a lot of the, the stuff that uh, uh, you learn with product school is very nuts and bolts around how to build better products and services. Today, I'm going to tell you how to build a better you, because we know that we can do our best work when we can focus. We can all see how these amazing devices that many of us build solutions on top of are wonderful. They can enhance our lives. And if you've checked out my first book, Hooked, about how to build habit-forming products, that book was all about how to use these products to build healthy habits in users' lives. But of course, we've noticed how distracted we've all become these days, unfortunately, about how we sit down at our desk and we somehow can't do what we say we're going to do. And so what I want to do is to, to, to first start with where we've been. Uh, you know, I, I uh, wrote Hooked, my first book about how to build habit forming products using this model, the Hooked model. And the Hooked model basically says that for a habit forming product to create a long term engagement with a customer, we need four basic parts. We need a trigger, an action, a reward, and finally an investment. And so some of you will be familiar with this. For those of you who aren't, the, the, the four basic steps work like this. So triggers, there are two types of triggers. We have external triggers and internal triggers. External triggers are these prompts, these pings, dings, and rings in our environment that prompt us to take an action. So if you think about it in the case of a social network, uh, it might be a notification on your phone. And that leads you to the action phase, the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. It might be opening the app, scrolling a feed, pushing a play button, these very simple actions done in anticipation of an immediate reward. 
Then comes the reward phase. The reward is where the user's itch is scratched. It's where the user receives what they came for. And it typically involves what's called a variable reward, some kind of intermittent reinforcement. And so this comes out of the work of B.F. Skinner, the father of operant conditioning. And he found that when he took these pigeons and he put them in a little box and he gave them a disc to peck at, every time they pecked at the disc, they would get a little reward, a little food pellet. But what Skinner found was that when he gave the reward on a variable schedule, meaning sometimes the pigeon would get the, the, the reward, sometimes they wouldn't, the rate of response increased. The pigeon pecked more frequently when the reward was given with a bit of mystery, a bit of uncertainty. And it turns out that all sorts of products that engage us, not only our tech products, you know, when you think about scrolling the news feed or checking a YouTube video, novels, uh, movies, spectator sports, right? Why do we like football so much? Just watching that ball bounce around is variable. It's interesting. It's uncertain. So these intermittent reinforcements are everywhere. And particularly when it comes to product design for engaging habit forming products. And then finally, the last and most important step of the hook is the investment phase, where the user puts something into the product to increase the likelihood of them returning. And this isn't financial investment. This is stuff like content, data, followers, reputation. All of these things improve the product with use and make it more likely that the user will return the next time through the hook. So that successive cycles through these hooks lead to forming an association in the user's mind, not with the external trigger anymore, but in fact with what's called the internal trigger. So now when users feel a certain thing, when they get a certain emotional itch, they turn to their device, they turn to the app, whatever the service is with little or no conscious thought. Now, I'm not gonna spend too much time on the hook because that was a topic of my first book and I, I've done classes for product school before on, on the hook model. So go check those out if you have a chance. Um, and, but I do want you to know that this technique works just as well for consumer web or for uh, enterprise clients, whether it's a business application, anything that needs to create a habit with, and is used with sufficient frequency, this hook model is very effective. And the idea behind it, the reason I, I, I popularized this model was because I wanted to help all of us product designers create products and services that people want to use as opposed to feel like they have to use, right? Why, wouldn't it be, well, why shouldn't we use the same techniques that Facebook and the gaming companies all, and, and many of these um, other uh, tech titans use to keep people engaged, we can use this for good. We can help people form healthy habits. I've invested in many companies uh, who have used the hook model for good, like Kahoot. Uh, the company went public recently and they're the largest educational software in the world. They keep kids habituated to learning in the classroom. Companies like Fitbod uh, that makes a product that keeps people in the habit of going to the gym. Uh, Pantry Labs, another company I invested in that helps people change their eating habits to eat healthier uh, through their, their products. So we can use habit-forming technology for good. But there's a downside. And the downside is that sometimes products are built so well, they're built so good, they're designed to be so engaging that sometimes we overuse. Now, for the vast majority of people, this is not an addiction. You'll notice that I did not call my book How to Build addictive products. I called it how to build habit forming products because addictions are always bad. And I can always tell when someone hasn't written my book, when they say, oh, Nier teaches people how to build addictive products. No, we don't want to build addictive products. Addictions are always bad. Don't build addictive products. Build habit forming products. Habit forming products can be used for good. We can change people's lives for the better. But you know, for most people, when they say they are addicted, they don't really mean they're addicted. Addiction is a pathology. An addiction is a disease. It's not an addiction. For most people, it is a distraction. It is overuse. And in my case, I felt that happening to me. So a few years after I wrote Hooked, I found that I was getting distracted more than I'd like. I, I remember on one particular occasion, I was with my daughter and we were in the room right behind me in her room. And uh, we had this afternoon uh, planned when, when we could just be together. And we had this activity book of different things that daddies and daughters could do together. And I remember that there was one question in this book that we both had to answer. And that question was to answer, the, 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 the question was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? And I wish I could tell you what she said, but I can't. Because in that moment, I got distracted. I started looking at my phone, doing something on my device, 
And I didn't realize that I wasn't giving her the attention she deserved. She got the message, she left the room. And when I looked up, she was gone. And so that's when I realized that I really wanted to get to the bottom of this problem. And so after writing Hooked, uh, it's been a bestseller, thank goodness, it's helped lots and lots of people build habit forming products for good. The next book I wanted to write was to understand the superpower that I would want. If you asked me what superpower would I want, I would tell you I would want the power to become indistractable. Indistractability, becoming indistractable will be the skill of the century. The power to do whatever it is that you say you want to do with your time. If you want to sit down at your desk and do that hard project that you've been procrastinating, I'm going to show you how to do that. If you want to be fully present with the people you love, I'm going to teach you how to make sure you follow through. If you know you should go to the gym, work out, eat right, but you're not, and you don't know really why you can't follow through and do those hard things, I'm going to tell you why. The reason why is because of acrasia. This term was used over 2,500 years ago by Plato and Aristotle. They said that this term described this tendency that we have to act against our better judgment. So this should give us some historical perspective, okay? Distraction is nothing new. People have been distracted and doing things against their better interest for at least 2,500 years ago, since the time of, of Plato. And this should give us some, some solace to know that, look, this is not a new problem. Facebook didn't invent this problem. Email didn't invent this problem. Your iPhone didn't invent this problem. It has always been here. What's changed is, if you are looking for distraction, it's easier than ever to find between the emails and the group chat messages and, uh, and, and Instagram and the news. There's just so much potential for distraction, but that doesn't mean we're powerless. To overcome distraction, we need to understand the difference between distraction and traction. The opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice both end in the same six-letter word, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do in life. The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that pulls you away from what you want to do, anything that you are doing not with intent. So this is very important to recognize for a couple of reasons. One. Anything be, can become traction if we say it is. If it's consistent with our values, enjoy yourself. Stop trying to put this moral hierarchy that says that checking Facebook and playing Candy Crush is somehow worse than watching a, a football game on TV. What's the difference? They're both pastimes. And if you plan to do it with your time, enjoy yourself. But you got to do it on your schedule, not somebody else's schedule. And we'll get back to that in a minute. The other thing that's really important here on the distraction side is that in at the workplace, we are constantly tricked by distraction. I call this pseudo work. You ever sit down at your desk and you say, okay, now I'm going to do that big project. I'm finally going to get to work and do that thing I've been procrastinating on right after I check email, right after I update myself on the news, right after I just get up to speed on what's going on on Slack. And then 20, 30, 45 minutes later, you're still doing the thing you didn't plan to do. But that feels worky, right? I kind of need to do that anyway, right? That's like a work thing. No, it's just as much of a distraction if it's not what you plan to do with your time. So what influences us towards traction or distraction? Two things. The first are what we call external triggers. External triggers, just like in the hook model, are the ping, dings, and rings, all of these things in our environment that move us towards traction or distraction. Most people, when they think about distraction, they think about these external triggers, right? They think about their phone, they think about email, they think about all these pings and dings. But it turns out that the most common source of distraction are not the external triggers, but in fact, they are the internal triggers, these uncomfortable emotional states that we seek to escape. This turns out to be the root cause of most of our distractions. You see, the reason we tend to get distract, distracted so often throughout our day is because most distraction starts from within. We are using our devices for emotional pacification. In fact, all human behavior, 
everything you do all day long, the product you are building, everything you work on or try and design for others fundamentally utilizes the core of human motivation. Why do we do what we do? Now, most people will tell you it's about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain, but that's not true. The true source of motivation is one thing, the desire to escape discomfort. Everything we do is about minimizing pain. Even the pursuit of pleasure, think about it. When you want something, when you crave something, when you desire it, you know, there's a reason we say love hurts. That is itself psychologically destabilizing. And relief comes by doing something to take care of that discomfort. So if all motivation is about the desire to escape discomfort, then that means that time management is pain management. So it doesn't matter what kind of life hacks and productivity tips you learn. Fundamentally, you have to learn how to master these internal triggers by either fixing the source of the problem or learning tactics to cope with that discomfort. If the source of your pain throughout your day is a toxic work culture, is a failing relationship at home, is something that's stressing you out day in and day out, you will constantly look for a way to escape. Some people escape with alcohol, some people escape with television, some people escape into their phones. So you have to first fix the source of the problem or you'll always have this need to escape. But look, the fact is every human being on earth will constantly feel discomfort. It's part of being a human being. Boredom, uncertainty, fatigue, loneliness, anxiety. This is just part of being a normal, functional human being. So what we have to do is, as opposed to letting these normal sensations get the best of us and lead us towards distraction, we have to learn tactics to cope with them so that they can lead us towards traction. So here's what we do. I'm gonna give you just a few techniques. There's a lot more in my book, Indistractable, but I wanna leave you with some techniques that you can start using right away. And of course, if you want more, then you can find that in the book later on. We have to start by understanding again that time management is pain management. And what I want you to do the next time you find yourself getting distracted, I want you to just take a moment to note the sensation. Psychologists tell us that just writing down that feeling is an amazing way to start getting control over it. Then what I want you to do is to explore that sensation with curiosity rather than contempt. I want you to do what's called surfing the urge, to just feel that sensation and don't beat yourself up, right? Most of us, myself included, when I got off track, I would say, oh, you see, I'm lazy. Uh, I have an addictive personality. I, I have a short attention span. There's something wrong with me. And that's not true. For the vast majority of people, there's nothing wrong with us, right? Some people, of course, do have an addiction disorder or obsessive compulsive disorder, but that's single digit percentages. The vast majority of us do not have anything wrong with us. And yet we have this conversation in our heads that we're somehow deficient. Don't do that. Instead, what I want you to do is to go to your phone and tell your phone to set a timer for 10 minutes and tell yourself that you can give in to that distraction whether it's eating the chocolate cake, whether it's checking uh, your email when you wanted to focus on a different product, uh, 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 task at hand, whatever it is that you wanted to do when you find yourself about to get distracted, note that feeling and spend just 10 minutes surfing the urge. And here's what I want you to do. You have two choices. You can either get back to work, get back to the task at hand, or get curious about that sensation. Okay, I'm feeling bored right now. This is difficult work. And I want you to have that conversation with yourself in your own head, the way you would talk to a friend. So if, if you find yourself, get, if, you, if a friend got distracted, you wouldn't say, oh, you're lazy. You would say, hmm, you know what? Getting distracted and because of a feeling, because of boredom, anxiety, fear, discomfort, that's normal. That's part of the process of getting better at something. You see, you're getting better at this task. So talking to ourselves kindly, the way we would talk to a friend is very, very important. We'll get back to that a little later as well. So the next step, and again, this is the tip of the iceberg. I only have a few minutes, but I just want to give you a few techniques. So remember that 10-minute rule. Very, very effective. The next technique is to make time for traction. Now, here's the deal. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Let me say that again. This is super important. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. Meaning, if you don't plan your day 
somebody else will. You know, when I was writing my book, I spoke with a friend of mine who's, who was particularly distracted, uh, used to be, now she's not. And she told me, oh, I'm so distracted all the time. I can't get anything done. My boss wants this and my kids want that. And did you see what happened in the news today? And did you, I mean, there's so much happening. I can't get anything done. And I said, wow, that's really tough. Can you show me what you plan to do today? What's on your calendar? And she took out her phone and she opened her calendar app and it was blank. There was nothing on it. And so that's ridiculous. Two thirds of people with a, two thirds of Americans do not keep a calendar. That's not an option anymore. In fact, not only do we need to keep a calendar, we need to keep a time box calendar. I want you to account for every minute of your day, not to record everything you do. That's not what we're talking about here. I want you to make a template for how you want to spend your time because you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. If you have blank white space in your day, you know what you're gonna fill it with, email and Slack channels and whatever's going on on here, that's what you're gonna do with your time. So instead, I want you to turn your values into time. Do you value your friends? Where is it on your calendar? Do you value physical fitness, taking care of your body? Where is it on your calendar? Do you value taking time for your brain, learning new things? Is it on your calendar? I want you to make time for those things as well as time for focused work. See here, we've got time for our email. We have time for our meetings and we have time to do focused work. So many of us spend our entire day reacting to stuff, reacting to email, reacting to Slack notifications, reacting to meetings, and we have no time for reflection. But we know that that's where we do our best work. So we have to make time for that as well. So make time for traction by planning the time, not the output. The time is your input. What we as product people do, we come up, our job, your entire job, I don't care what you do, your job is to come up with novel solutions to hard problems. That's what you do, whether you're a designer, an engineer, an entrepreneur, your job is to come up with novel solutions to hard problems. But you can't do that if you don't have time to think. So make sure you plan that time in your schedule as well. Then I want you to get rid of low value work. The Harvard Business Review found that about half the time, the average, I'm sorry, not half the time, one, uh, 20%, about one in five days per week is spent doing low value work. So cumulatively throughout your week, if you're like the average knowledge worker, you're doing all sorts of tasks you don't need to do. Booking travel, booking meetings. That's not the kind of thing that most product people need to spend their time doing. They need to spend their time coming up with novel solutions for hard problems. But then who's going to do the job? Well, guess what? The beauty of the age we live in is that we have tools like artificial intelligence, machine learning to do that stuff for you. I use a tool called x.ai that has an artificial intelligence that books my meeting for me so I don't have to do this ping pong game going back and forth with people's calendars. Lots of tools out there you can use. And then I want you to make sure you spend less time communicating and more time concentrating. To do our best work, we need time to think as opposed to constantly reacting to every every potential distraction. So put that time in your calendar. Now, part of the reason that these, ex these external triggers, uh, the emails, the no Slack notifications are so distracting is that they come with these external triggers that prompt us many times towards distraction. And it's not that external triggers are always bad. If your phone rings you and it's a call that you plan to take, or it reminds you, hey, go work out, or you have that lunch date with someone you've been meaning to meet up with, then that's fantastic. That's leading you towards traction. But if it pings and dings you when you plan to be with your daughter, as is the case when I was with, with my daughter, and I wanted to spend quality time with her, and here I was using my phone for work stuff, well, now that's a distraction. So the idea here is that we want to understand when these external triggers serve us and when we serve it. There's one profession where these external triggers are literally a matter of life and death. If I were to ask you what the leading cause, oh, sorry, I gave away the answer. There. <laughs> if I were to ask you what the leading cause of death or the third leading cause of death in the United States is, uh, and, and I'll give you the first two. The first, the first one is heart disease. Number two is cancer. The third leading cause of death, if it was a disease, believe it or not, is prescription mistakes. Thousands of people every year are harmed or die when healthcare practitioners give them the wrong medication or the wrong dosage of medication inside hospitals. Now, most hospitals in America believe that this is just a fact of life. And I think this occurs all over the world, unfortunately, that this is just 
you know, something that we have to live with. It's unfortunate, but what are you going to do? That is until a brave group of nurses at UCSF decided to figure out what was causing this problem. Because after all, this is a 100% preventable human error. And when these nurses analyze this problem, they discovered that the source of why so many nurses were, were dosing out the wrong medication was distraction. While they were giving out the medicine, they were interrupted by their colleagues, by patients, by doctors, and they were making mistakes. Now, the scary part is they didn't even realize that they were making these mistakes until it was too late, until someone died or was harmed by this error. They didn't realize. They thought they were doing a great job. And of course, this happens to us all the time. We think we're doing great work, but we don't understand how much better our work could be if we could work without distraction. So these nurses, they came up with a solution to this problem that reduced prescription mistakes by 88%. 88% they reduced this problem. And the solution wasn't some multi-million dollar program. It wasn't some crazy new technology. It was plastic vests. Plastic vests that told their colleagues not to distract them right now. And you know what? We can learn from these nurses and we can adopt a similar practice in our own lives. So for those of you who work in an open floor plan office, you know how distracting other people can be. It's not just our phones and computers that have, inter that, that have external triggers built into them. People can be external triggers that take you off track as well. So here's the solution. In every copy of my book, Indistractable, there is a cardstock sign that you can pull out of the book fold into thirds and put on your computer monitor. I call this a screen sign. And it tells your colleagues very politely, I'm indistractable right now. Please do not disturb unless it's really important. Come back later. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're saying, well, but that's what I can put earphones, you know, headphones on for. And then people will know that I'm, I'm, I can't be distracted. Okay, true. Maybe they won't bother you. But here's the thing. Everybody thinks you're watching YouTube videos. So it's much smarter to be explicit about this and give other people permission by setting this cultural norm that it's okay to work without constantly being distracted all the time. We set this cultural norm that, that can permeate throughout the organization, hopefully throughout the world. And if you don't wanna buy the book, that's fine too. I'm gonna to give you a link where you can download this screen sign for yourself, print it out and put it and start putting it to use in your own office today. We can also use technology to help hack back these external triggers. So you can use tools like Do Not Disturb While Driving. This is a great tool. You can customize it any way you wish. So here's how it works. When you use Do Not Disturb While Driving and someone texts you or calls you, they automatically get a reply that says whatever you want it to say. In my case, it says I'm indistractable at the moment. Uh, I can't pick up this call. But if this is urgent, please text me the word urgent. And if the person texts the word urgent back, then the, the text message will come through. So this is a tool that comes built in with, with our, uh, if you have an iPhone, there's a similar feature on Android phones as well. Here's another thing we can do. How many of you have desktops that look like this? Why? We don't need to live like this anymore. These are all external triggers that psychologists tell us degrade our performance. And you think, oh, I'm doing a great job. No, you could be doing a better job without all of this distraction. Do this. Take all those files, put them in one folder, call that folder everything. And when you need something, you search for it. You don't need all that digital, digital clutter. It is, it is preventing you from doing your best work. Same thing goes with our phones. All of these notifications, these pings, these dings, these rings, we don't have to live like this. We can prioritize only the apps that deserve to interrupt us, things that are actually urgent. And that's what we wanna put on our home screen, leave the rest on another, another screen. So I want you to start hacking back these external triggers by first asking yourself for every external trigger, ask, is the external trigger serving me or am I serving it? And get rid of the ones that aren't serving you. Then I want you to make sure you adjust those notification settings. Again, two thirds of people with a smartphone don't do this. Very simple to do. We can adjust those to make sure that the ones that are worthy of, of an audible disruption, right? Like a, like a ping or ding versus just a, a visual interruption, like one of those meatball icons. And we can very quickly do this. And in just a few minutes, we can do this for all the apps that we keep on our phone. And then finally, and this is very important, leave those distracting devices outside of meetings. This is something we have got to change. How many of you have been in a meeting where you're sitting around the table and half the table is on their phone? 
Well, that's pointless. If we're going to meet in the physical world, we need to meet in both body and mind. We need to be fully present. And so what I recommend is having one laptop per meeting. And that, that laptop does nothing but project on a screen so we can make sure we record everybody's notes. Because when we use our devices inside business meetings or among friends, there's a secondhand smoke effect, right? That when you see someone else checking email, you're like, oh, oh, I wonder what emails I might have. So let me check for a minute. And then we have a bunch of warm bodies around the table that might as well be zombies because nobody's paying attention. So let's kill that practice. It's not serving us. The last step is to prevent distraction with pacts. Now, to explain how pacts work, I want to take you back 2,500 years to the story of Ulysses in the Odyssey. This is written, the, the, the philosopher Homer wrote this book. And in the story, Ulysses is this hero that has to sail his ship past the island of the sirens. The sirens are these mythical creatures who sing this magical song and any sailor who hears it uh, wants to sail his ship to the island of the sirens where the ship crashes against the, the shore of, of, of the island and they perish. Now Ulysses knows this is going to happen and he wants to make sure he prevents disaster. He wants to prevent getting distracted. So what does he do? He tells his crew to put wax inside their ears so they can't hear the siren song. And then he tells them to bind him to the mast of the ship. And he says, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, don't let me go. And you know what? It works. Ulysses can sail his ship right past the island of the sirens, safely returning his crew to, sa to uh, home. And so we can use this lesson in our own life. We can make these pacts with ourselves and others. So one of the beautiful things that we can do every day is to use technology uh, to block out technology. So we can use apps like self-control. I use it every day on my desktop to prevent myself from accessing sites that I know typically distract me, like Gmail, like uh, Google, when I want to do my focused work. Not all day, by the way, just for hours in my day when I have time box focused work. Apps like Forest. Forest is a great app. Uh, it's free. Here's how Forest works. You type in how much time you want to do focus work for. And when you hit go, a little virtual tree is planted. Now, if you pick up that phone and do anything with it, the virtual tree dies. Now, I don't want to be a virtual tree murderer. So that's enough of a, of a pact, a commitment I made with myself to, tell, to remind me, nope, that's not what you want to do with your phone right now. You want to stay focused for this period of time. You can also find a focus friend to make distractions harder. So finding a colleague to just work next to can help you stay on track. And if you work from home or remotely and you don't have a, a, a someone you can work with, you can go to focusmate.com. Now, full disclosure, this is a company I like so much. I actually invested in the company. Here's how Focusmate works. You go on to focusmate.com. You find a time in your schedule when you want to do focus work for and you are matched with someone else who also needs a focus mate. So this is a screenshot of the last time I used focus mate. I was sitting with this uh, uh, medical school student in the Czech Republic, and we both got to work. And just seeing that other person also doing focused work was incredibly helpful and helped me stay on track. This is really great if you're the kind of person like I used to be that has trouble getting started in the morning. Because if you don't show up for that focus mate, they're going to leave you a bad review. So you want to make sure you get there on time. So the idea here is to reduce distraction with pacts by using tech to block out tech. But I want to give you a word of warning that this technique, this fourth step, can backfire. It backfires for two reasons. One, it backfires when people don't do it in the proper order. So this must come last. You do this after you've mastered the internal triggers, after you've made time for traction, after you've hacked back the external triggers. This is what you do last. Second, this can backfire sometimes with certain people who, when they fail, as we all invariably do from one time or another on the path to becoming indistractable, some people can't get back on track. And those people, it turns out, are people who don't know how to be self-compassionate. They're the ones who don't know how to talk to themselves the way we would talk to a friend. And we talked about this a bit earlier and how important this is. Psychologists tell us that people who are more self-compassionate are more likely to reach their long-term goals. So if I told you by that time I was with my daughter and how I got distracted when I was with her, would you tell me I'm a horrible father, I'm a terrible human being? Not if you were my friend, you wouldn't. Maybe you would talk to me the way I'd hope you would talk to me as a good friend. 
And so why do we talk to our friend? Why do I talk to ourselves in such a mean way? You know, berating ourselves, telling ourselves we're deficient in some way isn't helpful. And here's what else isn't helpful. This idea that technology is hijacking our brains, that it's addicting all of us, that is not true. There is so much we can do to master to, to manage distraction. We can master our internal triggers. We can make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers and we can reduce distraction with packs. This is how we become indistractable. You know, when I was finishing up my book, I sat down with my daughter and I told her that I was really sorry that I didn't hear what she said the first time we had this question of what superpower would you want? And I asked her and I said, you know, if you could have any superpower, I'm really curious, what would your superpower be? And she told me that she wants the power to always be kind. That's what she said, honest to goodness. And the more I thought about it, I realized, wow, you know, that's actually a superpower that all of us can have. We all have the power to be kind, don't we? And so that's exactly the same scenario when it comes to this superpower becoming indistractable. We all have tech, the, the power to get the best out of technology without letting it get the best of us. We all have the power to become indistractable. And with that, thank you very much. I will have one more request for you. If you could please uh, take a screenshot of this. If you have an iPhone, you can just open your camera app and point it to that QR code. Uh, if you have an Android device or if you're on your computer, you can go to opinion2.us. I would love to hear what you thought of the presentation. The book just came out a few days ago. It just became available in the United States. It'll be available uh, in, in the rest of the English speaking world uh, outside of North America on October 17th. So this is brand new stuff. I would love to hear what you thought of the presentation. And if you go to this URL and fill out the survey, very short survey, you will also get the slides you just saw. Feel free to share them with whoever you like. And if for some reason I don't get to answer your question today, you can go to nearandfar.com. Uh, there's a, a little contact form there. I'd be happy to answer your question later on as well. And with that, hopefully you've got the, the, the survey here and you've got that up. Uh, can I take it down or should I leave it up a little longer? You can keep it, leave it there. Keep it, okay, think, yeah. so, let's, so people let's can start, you know. Yeah, I have a few. Uh, first of all, thank you. I know <laughs> a lot of information. Uh, um, most of us will change our way we, we, we work, we live. Um, but I really appreciate um, all your wisdom there. So I have I have a few questions here. Let me start. You know, there are a lot of comments here. So maybe what I'm going to do is to read it. So you can, maybe we can make it faster. Sure. Um, so Kishore asks, uh, managers can always avoid interruptions coming as a part of work. For example, when team members are coming for some clarification, etc. So how to stay focused when something isn't actually a distraction, but switches your context? Yeah. So the, the part, the first part of the question was managers can always uh, find focus. Is that, is that what she said? Correct. Yeah. So what happens if you're a manager and, and one of your colleagues needs something right away? It is true that managers can't always uh, not allow people to distract them. I'm not asking you to always block out distraction. I'm asking you for certain times of the day to do what you want to do with your time. So the solution is quite simple, it's called office hours. So we make time in our time box calendar and we say, hey, I'm open any of these times. Come by, you can ask me a question. But this time in my day, I gotta work. I have to focus. So as a manager, you can't constantly be interrupted. You can't do your best work if people are constantly interrupting you all day. So carve out time in your day for you to think, to do your best work, and then make time in your day as well to have time open for your colleagues as well and share that schedule with your colleagues. So I'm not asking you to always be antisocial and never talk to anybody, no, but do it on your schedule, not when everybody wants your time. And actually you'll be amazed doing this practice helps people take care of their own problems. Letting people know, you know what? I have office hours every Wednesday and you can come by and talk to me at those times or whenever the time that you set for yourself, you'd be amazed how many times people can solve their own problems when they have a little bit of time to try and think for themselves. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, for example, when um, someone comes to you asking you, hey boss, what should I do here? Yeah. The boss says like, what would you do? Yeah. 
Oh, you know, I, I, I hate that question. That, that question of what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the uh -huh. reason people do that is because they get into the habit of it. Yeah. Right? The answer is think for yourself. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> think. Yeah. And people don't want to think. Most people don't want to think. Why? Because it's hard work. So yeah. why would I have to think if you can just tell me what to do? Yeah, yeah that's correct. Awesome. Let me move forward. Um, what's your take on, you know, Tim Ferriss recommendations in regard with the email use? Such as don't start your day with email and only check your email once a day. What do you think about it? I think that's too broad. It's too broad. What you want to understand is the strategy, not the tactics. Strategy is why you do things. Tactics is what you do. It's more important that you understand these four patterns, these four techniques that I talked about, the strategies of master your internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, and prevent distraction with packs, and come up with your own tactics. So if not checking email in the morning works for you, great. If that's what's on your calendar, awesome. But I'm not going to tell everybody that's the way they should check email. What if your job requires you to check email first thing in the morning? I check email first thing in the morning. I do it differently. So I have in my book about how to hack back email, and it's a technique that's in the book that can save you up to 90% of the time you spend on email. My, my friend Shane Snow is a fellow author, and he said it saved him 90% of the time he spent on email. Uh, and, you know, Many people don't have that luxury of just saying, I'm only going to check email once a day. Their job just requires it. However, what you don't want to do is to fill all the white space with email because then you're constantly reacting. Here's the first rule of getting less email send less email. And I show you in the book about exactly how to do that. <laughs> awesome. Um, there is another question. I know you, you were explaining the, 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 the graphic, um, but in your routine, how, how is your routine? How, um, how do you have the, like mental models or exercises during your week and versus your weekend in order to get more productive and indestructible? Yeah, so my schedule is set every week and uh, I'll actually... Um, let me see if I can give you a, a link here uh, as you ask the next. Uh, okay, I'll do it during the next question. I'll, I'll give you a yeah, link. Yeah. I built a special tool because uh, I, I, I found that uh, using uh, Google Calendar or a lot of other tools, Outlook or whatever, is overbuilt, that it's very hard to do this. So I built a, a tool for folks who are just getting started with time boxing that I'll, I'll give you a link for uh, in just a second where you can plan out every minute of your day. So my schedule is, is built out. The idea here is that you spend maybe 30 minutes doing it once, and then you just update it you know, maybe once a week. So you're sitting with it maybe 15 minutes. I have time in my calendar to do that as well, to sit down with my calendar and review it for the week ahead, of course. And you want to synchronize your calendar with your stakeholders. So I sit down with my wife, and we look at each other's calendar. I do this uh, with business colleagues as well. It is a life-changing practice. So many people out there, managers, they throw tasks to their employees, do this, do this, do that. That's output, but that's crazy without considering the input. We have to start synchronizing our calendars because where's the time to do all this stuff you want me to do, boss? So what we want to do when we start keeping a time box calendar is we can show our colleagues and say, look, here's what I'm doing with my time. Now, all this other stuff that you gave me to do, it doesn't fit. So what should I reprioritize? And we have that conversation. Without that, they're just throwing stuff at us with no time to do it. And so you know what happens. We do it on nights and weekends. And our families pay the price and our health pays the price for it. That has to stop. So making a time box calendar, sitting down with your, with your colleagues, sitting down with your, your significant other, and doing what's called a schedule sync takes 15 minutes, maybe even less, and it will change your life. Awesome. Um, uh, look at this one. This is super short, but it has a, like a, you know, a context. I have a boss who habitually multitask during meetings. Okay. As Wait, soon I'm as you're asking, as you talk here, just because I want to give you this link. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's okay. It's okay. No problem. No problem. Yeah. Let me continue reading. So yeah. um, as soon as you start talking, he pulls out his phone. He's fully convinced he can do things, two things at, at, at once. On conference calls, he sometimes puts the phone on mute while someone is talking and start talking to me. It's unnerving and demotivating. Aside from recommending your new book to my boss, what advice do you have for me? What, what was the part about recommending my, the new book to her, her boss? <laughs> because he was saying like, um, his she boss like- to recommend the, the new book or she does want to recommend the new book? He, he wants to do it. Yeah. Uh, also, um, what's your advice for him as an employee of this kind of boss that is always trying to do two things at the same time? 
Yeah. So uh, you, you have to have this conversation with your boss. Uh, however, you can get fired if he doesn't like or she doesn't like the way you say it. Because many employees, it turns so there's a whole section in my book about how to build an indistractable workplace. And many people blame the technology. They say, oh, you see, it's a technology doing this. And it turns out it's not the technology. The root cause of the problem is bad workplace culture. It's the kind of boss like you're describing here that is constantly connected themselves. And so they expect everyone to do the same. But that's crazy. Who wants to work in an environment like that? So the solution uh, is not to be too self-promotional, is not to tell them that to change. Let me do it. Okay. So tell them about how, look, if we adopt some of these tactics, we will be more productive, we will better serve our clients, and we'll increase, or sorry, we'll decrease employee turnover. You know, we know that there are a confluence of two conditions inside people's workplaces that literally drives people crazy. And this confluence is at work environments where people have high expectation and low control. Okay, high expectation and low control. And so when people work in those type of environments, these are the type of work environments where we see higher incidences of depression and anxiety disorder. It literally is a kind of work environment that drives people crazy. And you know what people do? They, they leave or they're constantly and or they're constantly distracted. They're calling meetings, sending emails constantly, not because they, that's the most productive thing to do, but because it makes them feel in control because they're desperate to feel more agency psychologically uh, because they lack agency and control. So sending emails, calling meetings feels in control. And that's exactly what's going on with this boss who uses his device so much. He's psychologically so desperate to control that he feels that through his device, right? And he's unfortunately promulgating this bad behavior to everyone. And I'm guessing, you know, from, from the tone of that response, people don't like working in that kind of place. So yeah. let, let me do the convincing. Open the, there's a chapter, a section in the book about how to build an indistractable workplace. Hopefully he'll read it. Hopefully he'll adopt some of those tactics and realize how important it is to make sure that to get the best work from uh, the employees and colleagues that he's working with, he has to demonstrate what it means to be indistractable himself or herself. Cool. cool. Uh, do you want to sh show something, to share something? Oh yeah, so I just gave you a link. Can you see the link I just shared? Uh, yes, I can see okay. it. I don't know if I'll, you can put it in Facebook. I'll, as well. I'll put it, I'll put it, of okay. course. So that's a free tool I, I built to make it super, super easy for anyone to make their own uh, time block, time boxed calendar for themselves. All right, all right. So I have two more questions. One is, how should a product manager lay out a focus plan for growth in industry level skill set? How, sh what, what kind of growth? Product growth or personal growth? Um... Say the question again. How should a how should a product manager lay out a focus plan for growth in industry level skill set? Ooh, I don't know. I'm gonna pass on that question. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, there's it's that's a little bit outside my wheelhouse. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Organizations out there that uh, product school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't have to. You don't have to come up with that question. In fact, it's you know, it's kind of like asking. Um, uh, a kindergartner to make their own uh, uh, growth plan. Like that's what product school does. Product school, they know the full curriculum, the full uh, skill set that a product manager right. should get. That's what the program is all about. You don't have to do that for yourself. That's correct. So, I mean, we always add the final question. So I'm talking about indestructible. Um, what will be your final advice to those aspiring product managers in this competitive world about what you can teach us today? Yeah. So my parting thought is that becoming indistractable is the skill of the century, that you will outperform other folks at work, you will do better for your company, you will help the, the customers you serve when you are indistractable. And we can make a huge difference out there when we can show others what it means to be indistractable, because this kind of stuff is contagious, right? It's kind of like with smoking. So in the United States, at least, I know, I know you smoke more over there in, in Madrid than we do in the United States, but in the United States, 60% of the U.S. population smoked, today 14% and falling. And so that happened, some part because of regulation, but a large part because of social norms. People realized, oh, I'm not supposed to smoke in your living room. Okay, I understand. I'll go outside. We have these new norms. And that's exactly what's happening with our devices and distractions. So part of the reason I'm wearing this shirt that says indistractable is because I want to be an indistractable person. Becoming indistractable doesn't mean you never get distracted. That's impossible. We all will get distracted from time to time. 
Becoming indistractable is defined as being the kind of person who does what they say they're going to do. It's about living with personal integrity. And so I want to remind myself, this is one of the techniques in the book around how behavior change is identity change. We need to start calling ourselves, just like people call themselves vegetarian or, or orthodox or Muslim or whatever. This is an identity that I'm the kind of person who does what I say I'm going to do. Now, sometimes I mess up, but I strive to do that. That is one of my, the, 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 the core pillars of my identity. And as this propagates throughout the world, it becomes easier for everyone. We're not constantly tempted by bosses who can't put down their phones, by friends who, when we get together for dinner, aren't on their devices, by kids who want to spend time with us as opposed to having to go to their own devices because we're available as well. We have more power than we know. So I want people to understand that, that we can do this if we know how. All right. Awesome. Uh, Mir, just to remind the people, where can we get your book? Is it already live? Where can we buy it outside the sure. U.S., inside the U.S.? So if you're in North America, so U.S. and Canada, it's available right now wherever books are sold, Amazon, wherever you'd like. Uh, outside of the U.S., uh, it is will be published in uh, the U.K. and Commonwealth countries on October 16th. Uh, it'll also be published in Korean, German, uh, Vietnamese, Taiwanese, Dutch, Russian, uh, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, lots of languages that I have listed over here <laughs> as well later on the year. So if you want to read that, uh, you can also go to indistractable.com, indistractable.com. And there is a free video there as well. If, if you pre-order the book and you submit your um, order number, you get access to a free video course as well as an 80-page workbook. All that's complimentary as well. Awesome. And where can you get the t-shirt? The t-shirt? Oh, that uh, you need to know somebody, but uh, I have connections. Get, get in touch with me later. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So thank you, Nir, again. Thank you for your time, your wisdom, or your passion trying to teach us um, this. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, I know that the, you know, the viewers, the pro school community, we really appreciate your time. It's a honor to have you. And of course, we'll Keep like you know getting more knowledge from you as as much sure. as possible. Um, sure. I thank you the whole community for this life. Um, hope to see you next week. Um, so have a nice uh, rest of the day. Thanks very much. Bye bye. Bye.